Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, it's an after lunch session and doesn't really help when you have competition from Google, IBM, PayPal, and the hall is at the very end of the convention center, right? But hopefully, the title of my presentation is a hash of two Hollywood classics. And I wanted to make sure that technology can be dull, but the stories behind it can be as exciting as Hollywood fiction. So that's what I'll try to do. Hopefully, you like it. I'm Shivinder Singh. I'm a senior big data technical architect at Verizon. And uh, let's start. A few fun facts about Verizon. We are the largest 4G LTE network in the country. Largest all fiber network, one of the most reliable and secure uh, global networks in the world. We are a dedicated corporate citizen. We are using technology to empower social issues and address uh, issues like healthcare, education, energy management, and so on. So what role does data play in our business? And how have we been able to use data in more innovative ways? Customers today rely on wireless and broadband more and in more ways than ever before, right? And Verizon is at the center of this connected world. Our superior networks give us a competitive edge in delivering the digital experiences that are vital to the success of our customers and businesses. In addition to having a strong foundation in wireless and broadband, we are disrupting ourselves and the industry by building the technologies of the future, like Internet of Things, smart cities, 5G wireless, and so on. Our financial strength enables us to innovate, invest, and develop in our employee skills, as well as uh, reward our share owners. We are committed to using our technology to address social issues and ways and deliver the promise of digital as widely as possible. Most of all, we have the two things which are needed for any company to be a success in long term an ethical customer centric culture and the need to make the world a better place. Data is a critical resource for Verizon in, help, in, in leveraging our customer first promise. Some critical areas where data is powering our growth are growing demand for broadband and wireless, driven by video and social networking, more experiences going digital and mobile, example, uh, videos, music, commerce, and transportation, where the physical and the virtual worlds are converging together. So what has our strategy been over here? Where were, where were we? where we are right now, where do we see ourselves in the future. And uh, uh, so one of our very first cases which used Hadoop was for our network data. Now this is the most data heaviest application in the company. We are ingesting close to about 450 billion events a day, uh, massaging the data and presenting it to our customers. Since our initial success, we have come up with a real data lake. We have built a real data lake, which comprises of about 40 plus tenants. Now, each tenant has a business purpose and is addressing a critical business lead. We have used uh, use cases like device diagnostics, finance, supply chain management, and customer journey, et cetera. The data in the data lake is a great asset. And the value generated out of it, coupled with implementation of machine learning and Spark, is immense. The combination of these diverse use cases within a single data platform requires a governed data democracy to be able to judiciously allocate our resources to our development teams and data scientists so that we can empower them to come up with the most smart data sets, which can be beneficial to our business. So from a strategy perspective, who are we? How do we deliver value? And how do we capture value? Now let me say it as an answer. Verizon is a great place to work. 
We employ some of the best engineering minds in the world, and we have some of the best talent. At the beginning of the decade, we could easily foresee the burst of data which our applications would be generating, right? And we could also foresee that our legacy infrastructure won't be able to sustain that kind of growth. Our turn to open source Hadoop and the Hortonworks platform was essentially inspired by the, by the need to modernize our infrastructure. The Hadoop platform has enabled us to look at data with the volume and variety, which was always a challenge in the past. The ability to stitch the data and drive cross-channel analytics with diverse use cases within a single infrastructure platform has helped us in generating data patterns, which through BI and data science tools, machine learning applications, and emerging cognitive applications empower tens of thousands of V-teamers on a day-in, day-out basis to help drive our business forward. Now, the year 2011, that year was very eventful in my life. That was the year, you know, when we had started to uh, look for alternative technologies like I do. And my wife and my, uh, myself, we were having our first baby. So, as you can see, you know, as new parents, you always have uh, that mindset that, hey, this year is a very, very challenging year. It's opening up new learning opportunities. And most of all, it has sleepless and long nights. And over a period of time, these would go away. However, it turns out that reality is always quite different from what you expect, right? Technology, I don't think, is in any case different. I've seen my kid grow up and Hadoop at Verizon grow up almost. Um, they are the same age right now. So you, the way we would think, okay, these problems get replaced, um, will go away. But it turns out that those problems get replaced by some other set of problems. And that is essentially what happens with technology also. You have different kind of issues when you, when you are at an infancy stage, and those issues get replaced with different set of issues when you're running at scale. So that's what you know, we started, uh, we saw within our systems, that over a period of time, <laughs> that as we grow, grew in the technology curve, right, some of the issues were essentially starting to show the symptoms of reverse aging. Now, what is reverse aging, you know? What does that even mean in the terms of technical concepts in a technical conference? Before we go over there, let's uh, visit a very basic and pristine concept of Unix, which has always been there since the Unix systems were invented. Inodes, right? I'm sure we all are aware what inodes are. Inodes are essentially the metadata of data. They store your file information like uh, what's the mode of the file, what's the ownership, timestamp, block size, you know, all those kind of information. And this concept has always been there since, uh, since uh, Unix was invented. And if you think of it, when the, where I come from, we essentially were in a single server kind of architecture. And we used to give a lot of focus on managing the inodes. And if you think of it, say, for example, you have a file system called slash data. And slash data is 200 GB used. And that 200 GB used is between 20 files of 10 GB each. Now, you go and do a LS over there. The output comes back pretty fast. However, what happens if you replace those 10 or 20 files with 2 million or 20 million files? You try to go and do an LS over there, and the output would never come back. Or if it does, it comes back after a long time, right? So that is one of the most basic, pristine problems of Unix, which has always been there ever since the systems were put into place. And as technology grew, in my opinion, you know, the technology adoption and maturity always follows an S-curve. So there's a time where the technology is fermenting, it is taking off, it reaches to a mature level, 
and after that it shows a bout of reverse aging. So what is reverse aging? I'm sure we have a lot of Hollywood fans over here, right? One of my favorite movies is Curious Case of Benjamin Button. So the basic premise of that movie is that a kid is born with symptoms of old age, like arthritis, and as the baby ages, he ages in the reverse direction. So he starts with the symptoms of old age and reverse ages all the way up to infancy. So how does that relate to us? So remember, we talked about a single server and how it is managing the high nodes. So that was essentially the takeoff and the fermentation period of the technology. And over years, a new exciting technology came in the market called Hadoop. And what did Hadoop bring along with it? It brought a concept of name node. And what does the name node do? The name node manages the metadata for your file system data, right? So essentially, that was the maturity of technology. You were in single system mode, and now you have a concept in place where your metadata is essentially being managed, not for just one server, but for tens of thousands of servers. And if you think of it, what is a name node? The name node process is essentially a JVM, right? So it is bound by the uh, 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 limitations of a JVM process. It has to do a GC. It has to have a heap, and the heap needs to be tuned. Your memory settings need to be adjusted. So it is bound by the classical problems of JVM tuning. And in the same, uh, in the same way as it is doing the block management, we were seeing bouts of concept or uh, 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 issues which were forcing us to go back essentially in time to revisit some of the very basic concepts which we thought we had overcome and go and address them. So what was happening? So essentially what started to happen was that our name node was seeing a significant impact. Over, over some years, over a period of time, you know, as a cluster was picking up in growth, we started to see high GC pauses within, within our name node process. Now when that would happen, our RPCs will start going into minutes. And now when that happens, your cluster is essentially totally unresponsive. Your jobs are stalled, and it is a full downtime kind of a situation. Now it does not really help if you have about 40 plus tenants on your cluster, and each tenant has signed a different SLA agreement with the business, and their reports are depending on the platform stability. So it is a very precarious situation, which, uh, which you can be you know, if you are dealing with um, uh, these kind of issues. So what was our analysis? How we did we start to approach the problem? So analysis is typical paths, right? Like any one of us would follow. You engage with support. And the typical re uh, recommendation whenever you're running into GC kind or heap issues is, hey, bump up the heap size, right? Now, I don't think that is one of the best solutions at all. It requires you taking a downtime, restarting your cluster, your business is impacted. But anyways, we did that. It got us a few weeks, bought us a few weeks of time. And then over one weekend, we started to see the same symptoms come back again. And at this time, you know, we engaged some of the best uh, HDFS engineers at Hortonworks, and they were, uh, they were able to work with us, and they essentially gave us about five patches, bug fix patches, which we applied to our system. Now, the key thing to understand over here is that whenever you are in this kind of a situation, or what this, the mindset of support, for that matter, also, is to get your system up and running. Your business is getting impacted, so you want to get your jobs back on track. Root cause, yes, I worry about, but my focus is on getting the system up. I'll come back to the root cause later. So you know that was the intention with which we were working. We have to get our business back on track. And let me introduce another Hollywood classic over here. So I'm sure we have a lot of fans of Lord of the Rings over here. 
It is one of my favorite movies. My favorite character in the movie is Gandalf. Now, what's the role of Gandalf in the movie? He's a path shower. He shows you the direction, and you walk on it to reach your destination. I don't think we have David Strieber in the audience over here from Hortonworks, but you know, he's one of the smartest guy in Hortonworks. And after things had settled down a little, and I had done all my due diligence along with the HDFS engineers on what the issue essentially could be, I reached out to David. And David was gracious enough to spend some time with me. And the piece of advice which he offered was very simple. He said, Shivinder, you know, you must have been looking into all the concepts, all the hi-fi concepts, name node tuning, JVM patching, you know, um, RPCs. But maybe, and I'm sure that you have already looked into those things. And I'm sure that our engineers have also looked into things. Why don't you just go back to the very basics of things or how they work? Now, you know, our mind was essentially, we had matured in the S curve of technology adoption. We were dealing with all the high five fundas, fundamentals. And all of a sudden, uh, we were getting someone over here who was telling us to go back in time and to start look at very basics. But we picked up on that cue. You know, we took it and we started to explore things. And when we started to do that, we started to see patterns emerge. And what level of basics did we go up to? We went all the way up to block level. If you see over here, the data over here, that is for two applications which we have, for two clusters. It's just a comparison. Now, the single client application, this is the first application which I talked about in our presentation, you know, the single, the network data, which is the biggest data application which we have. And on the other side, we have the data lake. If you see the topmost database, and for the sake of simplicity, you know, I'm just focusing on Hive over here. Um, I'm not dealing with any other HDFS components um, because I think this is a good representation of the issue which we are trying to address. If you see over here, our biggest database on the data lake size is almost identical in size to your single client. However, there are two key differences. On the single client size, your average block size is about 131 MB. And on the data lake side, it is only 11 MB. On the single instance side, you have 2 million files. But on the data lake side, you have 16 times more, 32 million files. So what does that tell? That you are dealing with the classic small file problem of Unix, which has always been there ever since the systems were invented. So we essentially you know, moved from a single server architecture all the way to a maturity, running at scale, thinking of about you know, how things uh, are different in, in this new world, and all of a sudden, we have to reverse age and go back into the very basic concepts of Unix and try to deal with them. Now, I think you know, this is both a challenge of uh, running a data lake. On a data lake side, your vision is you want to empower your developers, you want to empower your data scientists to be more agile, to be able to come up with smart solutions fast enough. However, what happens over there is that you tend to lose control. On the single client side, that is a very tightly closed in, uh, application which we have. For the nature of the business, the access is very limited, the code pushes are very limited, and they are very tightly governed. But on the data lake side, you know, it is essentially developer empowerment. You are making your developers more agile, but at the same time, you might run into issues which uh, uh, you might not be uh, prepared for. So what was the root cause and how we, did we fix it? Okay, once we identified it, we went back to the very basics. You know, we sat down with our development teams. We sat down with our tenants, and we started to review with them the basics of what is the business problem you're trying to solve. And when we started to do that, you know, we reviewed about 456 databases, 400K tables, 5,000 jobs. And when we started to do that, 
we started to see more patterns emerge out. At times, the users would say, you know, hey, we just need, we need to run the job every 30 minutes, five minutes, 30 seconds. So at times, the, fi uh, the fixes were simple enough, adjust your job frequency. At times, they were very detailed. We had to sit down and tune the jobs with them. So the challenge of the problem was essentially not just jobs. You have small files which were written by the, by the application for some of their use cases. On top of it, you have the compute power, which is running haphazard because of uh, you know, the data democracy you have over here, and uh, uh, there's little governance. And then on top of it, you are essentially in a situation where everything has a trickle-down effect, and you're sitting like uh, on a thing which is waiting to explode. Now, another significant area for us was a zookeeper tuning. We'll come back to this in a minute. So once we started to review the jobs, we started to see the patterns emerge out. And if you see over here, the job comparison run times between 2017 and 18, you'll see that the job run times in 2018 are much more optimized and less than what we had in 2017. So that was essentially the effort which we put in along with our development partners to uh, tune the jobs, adjust their frequencies, you know, and address the critical business needs. If you see over here, the number of jobs, the run counts, job counts in 2018 is much lesser than compared to 2017. That does not mean that we went to the business and asked them not to run jobs. It just means that we optimize our jobs and the jobs were able to run in a much more uh, efficient and time uh, efficient manner than the, than the previous year. So previously, you know, at times what would happen is that one job, uh, it's a data lake, right? So the checks and balances might not be in place. You have one job which kicks off, another job which kicks off after that, and there are no checks and balances, and it's a pile-up effort, a pile-up thing which keeps on piling and piling on. So that is what we tuned, you know, the job frequency, the job counts, and optimization of the jobs, along with uh, some of the cluster-wide setting, right? So what were some of the other considerations? So ever since HA has been enabled on the name node, your zookeeper has become a very critical component for the stability of your cluster. And it is very important to have a zookeeper which is lean, mean, and fast. In our case, when you are running a data lake or uh, environment, if you look at it, what are the, you are trying to, the basic thing you're trying to do is empower your developers. You are, you are running in a full, fully DevOps model where developer empower, uh, empowerment is pertinent so they can address the issues. And at the same time, the, uh, each data lake tenant is an organization, and that organization has hundreds of employees in it. Now, these hundreds of employees are trying to solve use cases, and, when, uh, and they are trying to be more agile, more faster to do that. And when they are trying to do that, they are looking out for tools which can help them be faster, right? And on the other side, there are tools and companies who are reaching out to them, hey, we have this tool, that this will make your life much faster and easier, right? So when the, all of this is a good thing, you know, we are working to uh, solve a problem, to address our business needs, and these are the steps in the right direction, but when these uh, vendors reach out to our tenants, the simple question they ask them is, um, our, our tenants ask them is, hey, what do you need on the cluster side? And the answer typically is, well, we just need a HS2 connection and access to the client gateway. You know, that is the most uh, uh, common response from them. And it is very easy to be blindsided by what tools are eventually hooked up into your cluster, into your data lake, right? And so we are in a, we, we are in a situation where we have numerous third-party components which are running on a cluster. And one of those applications, it so happened, was writing a lot of Z nodes. Now, the HTTP components amongst themselves are very efficient 
in managing their Xenodes. They write them properly, they push them properly. But this application was writing the Xenodes at a tremendous rate, and it was never purging them. So what did that cause to happen? Well, it increased the snapshot file for a Z, uh, a Zookeeper logs to go up to about 10 GB. And the recommended size for that is 100 MB. We had close to 5 million Z nodes on a cluster. And, a, and when you have a Zookeeper of this size, your entire cluster operations are essentially sitting on a very unstable environment and can stop at any time. So we, you know, we came up with a targeted approach. We push target, uh, uh, targeted Z nodes. We brought them down to about 100K. And then the file size of a Zookeeper snapshots came down to about, about 70 MB, less than the recommended size of 100 MB. And now we have an ongoing process in place where you know all of these Z nodes are purged automatically. And we have a much more efficient, reincarnated, strong, uh, and lean Zookeeper. So now that was what we were over here. How do we go from here? How do we use these learnings to take us forward? Oh, when, before coming over here last week, you know, I got a chance um, uh, to skim across a very in uh, interesting theory in physics, the string theory. And there was a very interesting quote in the, in the theory, um, which for some reason I was not able to take out of my mind, and I could not help correlate it to our use case. The quote says that if the universe is a play, the particles are the actors, and gravity is the stage which is holding all of them together. How does that correlate to us? Well, if you think of it, the business which we are running is a play. Our applications, which are serving our customers, which are performing for them, are the actors. And the infrastructure, which is holding all of them together, is the gravity. And if you think of it, what is gravity? Gravity is a force. And what is force? Force is mass times acceleration, right? So what does that mean? That force is directly proportional to mass. The more mass you have, the more gravity you have acting on you, the more force acts on you, the lesser mass you have, lesser force acts on you. The more mass you have, the harder it is for you to escape the pull of gravity. The lesser mass you have, the easier it is for you to be ported around. What does that mean to us? If our applications are bulky, they are not lean, they'll have a more affinity to stick to your platform. If your applications are light, they are less massy, and not in terms of data itself, the data set itself, in terms of compute also. The more uh, leaner applications you have, the more ability you have to be platform portable. The more easier it would be for you to move across from one platform to the other. Now, I'm not saying that you, know, you could not move a massy application from one platform to the other. You could do that. However, there are only two outcomes of that which would, which would come. The first, you would need more energy to escape from one system to the other, from one platform to the other. And second, even if you were able to do that, the energy which the application would be using on the other side would be more, right? Your cloud bills would be more. Now, we are in the days of cloud today. You know, everyone is talking about very cool concepts. Unlimited power, unlimited CPU, GPU, memory, unlimited disk, reserved instances, dedicated instances, spot instances. All of these concepts are good. They are in the right direction. On the technology S curve, they are following the right path. They are leading us towards maturity. However, 
what needs to be kept in mind is that unless your, uh, your applications are well-tuned in place, your portability to another platform, any alternate platform for that matter, would be more challenging. You know, before coming over here, I got a very interesting WhatsApp message. Uh, what is the difference between a wise person and a smart person? And someone sent a different response, long-term thinking versus short-term thinking. Someone said, a smart person knows that a tomato is a fruit, but a wise person does not put it in the fruit basket. Right? In my case, I think a smart person is one who knows what gravity is, what the force of your infrastructure platform is, and a wise person is one who knows that how it impacts your applications and how uh, you know, it can increase the stickiness of your applications to your platform. Ultimately, performance is always constrained by the physical limits. Sailing ships are limited by the power of winds, copper wire by transmission ability, and semiconductors by the speed of electron. In the same way, we are bound by the concepts of Unix. Our platform selection is essentially bound by the limitations of the platform which we have, no matter what we platform we go to. And this is the learning we, which we want to take forward with us. Now, here is where I bring the very last Hollywood fiction for today into the mix. Shawshank Redemption, another one of my uh, favorite movie, all-time movies. In that movie, Andy has a very interesting quote when he says, what does he do for the warden? He's a phantom, an apparition second cousin of Harvey the Rabbit. So what's the phantom for us? The phantom for us is the Unix kernel. No matter what platform we go to, the basics do not change. The basics still remain the same. It is only the packaging which is changing. If you have your basic, basics right, you will be successful on any platform, be it on-premise, be it in the cloud, or any other platform of your choosing. And some of these concepts never change. The speed of light is a basic. Small files is essentially a technology limitation. You can go to any platform, you will have the full ability to screw that platform up to. And that is essentially, you know, both a bane and a boon of running a data democracy and a data lake. In our case, we are almost running a small mini cloud. That cloud is empowering 40 plus customers. It is empowering tens of thousands of V-teamers within our organization to be able to run their workloads in a smart and efficient manner, right? However, when you're trying to do that, you have certain challenges until, uh, which, you, which you might run into. And if you don't have the right governance policies in place, if you don't have defined code lines, uh, code policies, coding policies, application development policies, you know, those issues can come back and can take you back in time to reverse age where you have to address some of the issues which you thought were already solved. And issues are always platform agnostic. Some of these are very basic issues. They are the concepts. If your applications are not well tuned, if your code is not well written, you are bound to run into them sooner or later. So these are the learnings which we've had over the years and which we plan to take our next, next destination, whichever that might be, you know, in-house, on-premise, um, or any cloud. And those are the learnings which uh, we want, uh, which we have uh, with us to take, our, uh, help us in making our next, next journey a success. All right. Thank you all of you for joining us here. You know, please let me know if you have any questions.